Muzi Maimani is uh, one of my favorite politicians because he's a man of God who's operating amongst devils. Well, I guess uh, that, <laughs> that is um, in, open to interpretation, but uh, we haven't spoken for eight months uh, with what Wayne Duvenage was saying yesterday about independence being very important in the next election and his concerns about the IEC. It's an appropriate time to have a catch up with Muzi about where the One South Africa movement is going, but indeed his thoughts on, on what Wayne had to say. Thanks, Muzi. It's interesting how quickly time flies. It's eight months ago that uh, we were talking in the Johannesburg studio and you were at the time telling us that you're throwing your hat in the ring to become president of South Africa. Uh, it, to many people, was, but that sounds crazy. Uh, and maybe we, we can touch on that in a moment. But let me, let me just start off with what Wayne Duvernay from Arta had to say yesterday. He's very concerned about the, the election in 2024 being free and fair because he says that the Independent Electoral Commission has being, is being starved of funds. It needs more funds, but in fact, its budgets are being cut. Now, this is something that doesn't really mean a heck of a lot to many people, but I'm sure being in the business that you're in, this is very relevant. Yeah, absolutely. And so great to be with you. I, uh, I think it's an incredible platform for South Africans and proud of the work that you are doing at Biz News. And, um, and, and, I, and I think since we last spoke, there's been so much that has happened in our country. You know, we, we were just about to launch Build One South Africa, a political party. And since then, we've grown in all nine provinces. I'm grateful to, to respond to that. We've recruited over 450 candidates that are standing for elections in some direct form or another. We're raising a membership base that is now, or an activist base, because I believe that everyone who's building South Africa is part of the work that we're doing. And now that's sitting just below 20,000. We want to get it to 100,000 by November. And from our recent poll, we're showing the fact that South Africans are quite enthusiastic about our offer that is hopeful, that stays above what goes on. And I, I'm enlisting as I go more and more people to build. So I'm confident that what, to your point about the IEC, 2024 is going to be a very crucial election. And, and so it is deeply concerning when you reflect on the fact that um, the IEC has been un underfunded, but also the history of where the IEC's ability to handle elections has become progressively more stressed. And it happens in all democracies. When a liberation movement faces the threat of losing an election as the ANC does next year, this is going to be a period that we all have to keep a tight eye on what the IEC does. I've always felt that as a Chapter 9 institution that it reports underneath the home affairs, puts it at, at risk. That That is a very crucial dilemma that we face because as budgets are being cut, it is seen as a budget item. Secondly, the IEC has never had an ability to police uh, its own, um, when people contravene its own regulations. So when a party, in fact, campaigns illegally or does things like that, the IEC doesn't always have that ability because it's not a prosecutorial body. And it relies on other security agencies like policing, etc. So that's crucial. And next year, the election itself, for example, we typically would have two ballots if you go into a national election, one for national, one for province. Next year, you'll have three. So already now, there's a lot of work that has to be done about educating people heading towards an election. There are two registration weekends that are coming up in November and February. And so I really do think the IEC has been asked to do more with less which even if it was the best run institution in the country, that renders it at high risk. So we've got to pay deep attention as all South Africans because a free and fair election works for everybody. And already there are some, some massive challenges and headwinds coming up towards 2024. I'm glad you addressed that in a way that we can all understand. But the point you made there about three ballots, not two, explain that. Well, First and foremost, typically um, now next year with the inc inclusion or at least after the constitutional court judgment that said independence can stand for national elections, you've almost got to create a what is called a province to national ballot that includes parties and independence and a national ballot. So 
that already means voters have to be educated enough to exercise their choices across two ballots. And that's going to be an important thing going forward and, and a new education. Secondly, I had a, an extensive meeting with the IEC. Naturally, with more independents coming on board, the length of the ballot paper has now been extended. So printing of all of that has its own new dynamic that comes in. So there are some logistical issues. Uh, so next year, the size of boxes that you put your ballot in is going to change. The size of where you vote has to change. So so all of those practical um, um, organizational issues are coming onto the fore. But also, now when it comes to even counting of votes, now in the room, you are going to have more people. Remember, for everyone who has an invested interest in the election, has to be allowed to go and sit and watch how the votes are counted. So that's why, as Build One South Africa, I wanted us to be clear that we set up this political party, invite more people to participate in it, stand and represent their communities, so that we could achieve this. One, hold the IEC accountable as a collective body. That's vital if we're going to get a free and fair election. Secondly, be able to mobilize this activist base of 100,000 people who I want for them to be eyes and ears at every polling station. And and maybe if I can abuse this platform, I want to invite you. You might say to yourself, well, I don't know how to contribute to democracy. But the best way you can do is go man a polling station. Because when you're there, you can help count. You can make sure that the, 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 the results are free and fair. And then furthermore, that ultimately when it comes to the integrity of the entire electoral process, from the person arriving at their door, to voting, to counting, all of that, we've got to be strong to make sure that the IEC's internet systems or IT infrastructure works well. Because at the end of the day, we want the will of the people to be a representation or a, 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 as an outcome. So, so I'm inviting people here to say, do your bit, sign up, go participate, because this election is going to matter. Lots of practical steps. And it's, it was also at the last business conference, the same plea was made. Please just, if you want to get involved, become a party agent or a, a volunteer to, to be involved and make sure that the votes are correctly counted. On to you and the Build One South Africa movement. You've been under the radar to a large degree. Has this been by design or has it been because the work that you're doing is not sexy enough for the headlines? Well, you know, uh, the sort of headline work that we've been doing is obviously when we fight about our plan, and I, I have put together a plan about how do we keep the lights on. So as you know, I'm animated about an economy that works. And so if we're going to keep the lights on, we have to do a couple of things. Though. You know, Obviously, to find the fix for the 6,000 megawatt deficit that leads us to load shedding. Secondly, make sure that we fix ESCOM. I've already reached out to people about a build, own, operate system that can allow people to say, let's introduce safe nuclear, let's introduce technologies that can allow us to augment energy. But along with the more headline work has been taking the government to court in the fight against ESCOM. Because actually, you know, I can remember speaking to advocate Tembe Gangurai Tobi, and I said to him, to solve for the 6,000, let's reduce demand. And part of reducing demand, let's use all the roof space in schools, hospitals, and um, police stations, that on all of those things, that there's an alternative energy that is there. You reduce demand, but you also become more environmentally sustainable. And we won that battle in the court case. I'm still appalled, uh, and appalled is putting it mildly. I, I'm disturbed by the government that it now wants to challenge that ruling in court to say, no, 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 we are happy to find uh, generators and all of that for ministers and for whatever government apaches we've got, but we're not willing to do it for citizens. People are dying during load shedding. So I've put up that fight. So that's been one big fight that we've had. We are engaged in another one that speaks effectively just using courts and lawfare to make sure that, you know, I don't care in some ways the historical alliances of the ANC with Soviet Union. But I do care that their decisions are impacting the economy of this country. Today, we're talking about a currency that's devaluing. We're speaking about businesses that are struggling. And so we're involved in that work. And even as I'm going now, in 
the formation of a political party. You've got to do some of the work that we do online, on media, but we've also been on the ground. And this has been, for me, some of the more exciting work. In all nine provinces, effectively, we've gone out, engaged citizens, engaged communities. So, yeah, that's not the sexy work that maybe ends up in newspapers, etc. But it's important work because to raise that army to fight, but also to make sure your ideas are things that people speak about at dinner tables, takes more than just being on television. It actually takes people sitting at home saying, what do you think of Musi's idea about a national uh, civilian service where young people can spend a year? That's a conversation that people must have at home. So we've spent a lot of time doing that work. How are you going to become president? Yeah, uh, in simple numbers. Actually, what I'm asking citizens to do is, in many ways, we just need um, three million votes. It's it's a it's it's in the grand scheme of numbers. Uh, okay, um, we know there are more people who are not voting than are voting. We know that of the twelve million people who do vote for the NC, five and a half million of them are disillusioned. And ultimately, we also know that next year is a conversation about how do we form a government that involves multiple parties. And I'm comfortable enough to know that having led coalitions, uh, we did so in 2016 in Johannesburg where we brought parties together, and those lasted. Um, You will be speaking to Mr. Mashaba, and in all fairness, he would know that actually he didn't resign because the coalition collapsed. He resigned because of internal party issues. But we were able to keep parties together. And next year, I've anchored a plan, which I think uh, we will be able to speak to coalition partners to say, here's the plan we need to deliver on. Because this is not about personalities and, and positions. It's about what we do for the people of South Africa. Secondly, if we've got all of the votes, as I've as described to you, even at a basic level of two and a half million, we become the anchor party that can bring everybody together. And for every vote that we get, the more uh, BOSA members of parliament who come from communities are in there to advance the ideas. And furthermore, I really believe the choice for next year will fall between whether you think President Ramaphosa, if he's still around, is the president, um, or Julius Malema, or uh, John Stianazen, or myself. And I would think In that pool of four, if we all arrive with numbers, however relative they are, a government has to be formed in that. And I'm fighting hard in that space to say the values I'd stand for, the vision I have, must triumph. And I will form a coalition emerging out of that combination and and lead a way that delivers on that plan. Those 450 candidates, where are they going to stand? How are we going to know about them? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, As the election campaign obviously rolls on more, we are literally in two weeks' time, I'll be training them. We've got to whittle them down normally from the 458. And the qualification criteria is quite rigorous, right? They need a 1,000 signatures each. They need to produce that they're ethical leaders. They need to show the fact that they represent the community. These are not people we fished out and said, here's your candidate. You may not even live there, but here's your guy. So, We've been able to aggregate all of those people. We'll whittle them down to 200 national, 200 um, sitting across provinces. I'm comfortable enough to know that as we go to all the respective communities and all nine provinces, each of them will then run their campaign, giving their thousand signatures and engaging back their communities. And when the period of elections goes, you will know without a shade of a doubt, if you are elect living in Amarnas, you can go and say in Amarnas, Here's our candidate who's under bossa. That's who I'm expressing my vote for, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll be an independent candidate running under the bossa banner. We're bringing them all under. Because at, as, as the law that they've produced in parliament for independence, here's the difficulty, and that's why I, I, this needs clarity. For you to become a member of parliament, just standing on your own, and then no umbrella, nothing, just standing on your own, okay? You will need about 90,000 votes, and let's... Wish you well. You get 120,000 votes. You get 150,000 votes. Actually, what happens after that is that at the click over at 90,000, which you can only get in the province, you only get that seat and that seat alone. And then, so, and, and then the rest become wasted, right? Whereas if you stand with this bossa, actually, even at 50,000, you get your seat. And secondly, Now, coming back to the same electoral maths I've just put before you, 
at 100,000 votes, which you get, you could get more people standing in your communities. So to me, the Uber of politics, which is what we're doing, is giving that absolute political platform for communities to get direct representation and to ensure that we can get more people elected. So it's us hacking the system, if you like, and making sure that we get the best bang for buck. Macron hacked the system in France, changed the way they look at politics forever. Is, is this a Macron moment? It is a moment for us in the country. Uh, I, I would hate to compare myself to greats like Macron and whether you like President Trump or not, but he came and swept through uh, America. But I draw deep inspiration even from people like Haikiende Ichilema, the president of Zambia. Because what Haikiende did is that young leaders, good people, good people, to your introduction uh, earlier on, good people who are not these demagogues and loud and brash and racist and people who seem to portray leadership as this thing that we've got to be dictators of some sort, but citizens who actually have the right motives for people have been winning elections. And Sam Matakaza swept through Lesotho in a similar way, and I know Lesotho is a small country, but he swept through the way and said, let's offer a new thing in politics. My irritation with the current political system is not only that it isn't working for people, it's that it's stale. Go to parliament. It's like a pensioner's fund. It, 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 and I'm not being ageist, but we're living in a digital universe that requires new ideas for the future. And so I often jokingly say, somebody who stands up and says, I was at a conference with Oliver Tambo and we are where we were doing, doing together. What is that person going to tell me about the metaverse? Y young people are desperate for solutions about their future. So we've got to bring fresh talent to politics. And that's why, to back to those candidates, one of the things I've been most grateful for is it's a mix. You've got business people in the Eastern Cape that are, that are running multi-billion dollar businesses. We've got lawyers and advocates. We've got former ambassadors. These are people who have come together and said, yeah, and sure, some of them have been historically politicians, but they are cobbling together to say, we represent our communities because we want democracy that's linked to the people. Well, what about, you mentioned him earlier, Herman Mashaba, and I am looking forward to talking to him later today, and a another political party that says it's not it's it's a non-political political party which is the patriotic alliance they reckon they're coming from a different place as well are these kindred spirits for you given that they are also wanting to disrupt the status quo i think values values if we share common values this idea of ubuntu and dignity we share values that are non-racial if we share values of ethical leadership the notion that we advocate for the citizens those values must win. And so whatever vehicle enters that space and does that work is a vehicle you can work with. Because it doesn't matter how you square this circle. The truth of the matter is that any government next year, we have to solve for 12%. Now, the 12% comes here. If you took the current political parties, all of them, in the opposition, exclude the ANC, and the EFF, you still are 12% short. If you look at the EFF's numbers, they are sub 10%, but they have a particular set of values. And whoever they work with, those values will triumph. Whatever those, and if you dislike those values, be clear. So to me, my contestation actually for next year is the values that are represented by an EFF type universe solving for their 10%, as I'm solving for the 12% that I need that produces the values that are non-racial, Ubuntu, dignity, and mixed economy. So all of those people, we've got to be able to fix for that because fixing for that actually will ensure that we've got stability in government and values for the future because we can't just look at this election in isolation as is 2024 to 2029, etc. because there's still a country that we've got to govern post-2024. And I would hate to find myself in a space where, sure, you change the electoral maths but you're the governing infrastructure remains the same and the values remain the same. And then you end up with people who want to say, well, the constitution is a farce, Mandela is a farce, uh, all of those values. I cannot buy that. And I cannot accept racial mobilization. That's why we talk about build one South Africa. So my job is to fix for that 12%. And I'm calling on South Africans 
this is yeah you've got to bring those values to the table by voting for like bold one south africa because we'll bring people together for those values was the last question why is Build One South Africa not emerging on the opinion polls or the pollsters when they do their numbers, they say the ANC is perhaps at 47 and the DA at 27, etc. And when you go down the list, the best that anybody outside of the EFF can do is four or five percent. And uh, clearly, you guys aren't even coming up there yet. No, part of it is is obviously, well, we've got to look at it two ways. People follow people, Right. So before you follow a party, you follow someone. You follow a leader of a party. And I'm comfortable to know that of the top 10 leaders in the country and of all the ones that are activists, active, I'm still one of the top ones in opposition. Ahead of, uh, so you kind of, if you had to do a ranking, it's President Mbeki at the top and um, then you get President Ramaphosa and then you get President Zuma. And then after that, you get this cluster between myself Helen Zilla and Julius Malema. That, that's why. So, so, so the starting point is that people follow people, and I am comfortable enough that we've grown on all our platforms, social media, uh, activism, because people have been following Musi Maimane. And and at the end of the day, it's why I want to run and show people that we could lead this country, and that's why I'm asking for them to do that. So, so that's the first opinion poll that we've got to think through. Who can lead? Because it doesn't matter what the new upstart is. It doesn't matter. It's whether citizens can say, I can get behind that leader because he has a vision for this country. And then the second hard work that we are having to do, and I think closer to an election will become more and more, is the association between that and Build One South Africa. And as a political party, and that's that I, I'll be upfront here, that's the hard work that we're trying to link those two things because people need to know how to find Musi Maimani on the ballot. If it were easy just to stand as a presidential candidate, we'd do that. And we'd work with multiple candidates. But the truth is people have to find a place. And so Build One South Africa is that place. And they'll be able to find you on the platform. And we're building on to that. So so that's the gym. Your friend H.H. Hichilema showed it is possible and what he did in Zambia. I wasn't aware of the Lesotho story, but that's another one to look at. And Musi, thank you again for, for giving us your vision. Uh, there are lots of people who are supporting you. I guess they're just not sure whether their vote's going to count for you. And I think you've, you've articulated very well today why it will. Musi Maimani is the founder and leader of Build One South Africa. And I'm Alec Hogg from businesswatch.com. <laughs>